Hey, everybody. Welcome, 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 welcome uh, to this webinar in terms of talking about some trade partner agreements for the 21st and a quarter century, as we're already almost there. Um, for those who don't know me, because I saw a lot of folks on the list that I didn't know, I uh, just thought I'd do a real quick introduction of who I am. Thank you so much for uh, taking some time out of your day to be part of this webinar. My name is Brad Hubbard, and I'm a home building consultant. I've been in this industry since way, way back in 1993. Um, and we had a family home building business, and over the course of that time, I've probably built you know, over a thousand homes in my career. So I've seen the good, I've seen the bad in this industry. So if you've wondered just who the heck is this guy who's talking to you, and why is he qualified to say anything, I've, I've been through a couple things over the years. Um, and then the last few years, I've been able to consult with home builders all across the United States, uh, get to work on process improvement. Um, and just how they do their jobs every day. So thank you so much for being part of this. I think this is going to be a really, really, really interesting webinar. I can't wait to see what happens. Uh, those who've been on any webinars of mine in the past have known that I'm the type that I'm not afraid to try something new uh, on live TV. And, and even if I end up with egg on my face, so we never know what's going to happen. Uh, but you're, you're really in for a, a treat here, too. So let me just kind of go through a little bit about what we're going to be doing today. And uh, let's see if I can skip over here. We're going to sing trade partner. And I'm putting this out there, folks, um, as, as you're going to find out. This was the actual trade partner agreement. Well, it was actually re, redone on looking pretty for at least what I thought. But this was the agreement that our company used to build homes over all this time. And um, we have some experts that are coming on here with us that are going to take a look at this, help me improve it if it needs it. We'll see. We'll see. Um, and then uh, go from there. And then we're going to try to do this live in front of you. By the end of this, we're hoping that you'll have the chance to actually uh, get a copy of this. Now, this is my first time using this particular webinar software, and I found there's no way for me to upload anything and, and for you to pull it down. So at the end, I'll probably just send something out to you. So uh, hopefully you'll be OK with that. But I wanted to let you know that we do want interaction from you. So there's a chat um, chat bar over here, too. So make sure you're putting some chats in there, too. And um, uh, so we know where you're at. I'd love to see if you just say, hey, I'm coming from this place or that place or whatever on uh, this end, too. So make sure we interact, have questions anytime along the way. Please do so. We do our best to kind of keep an eye on that and, and be answering the questions. Enough about me blathering. Let me talk about some of the very special folks I have here today. These are some of my very favorite people in the industry. I put them in order of alphabetical listing by last name so they wouldn't get into a fist fight or anything like that, at least over the introductions here. Uh, and we're going to start here, too. I want to introduce you to Melissa Gallon. She's the founder of Doom B Agency. I'm not going to go into a lot of details because I want her to talk and you don't have to sit and listen to me all the time and tell you who she is. So, Melissa, thank you so much for being part of this. If you don't mind saying hi to everybody, tell everybody who you are and what you're doing. Yeah, hi, and thanks for having me, Brad. And um, it feels really good to be part of this panel. And I am a marketer. I've been in the industry for what feels like forever before I even really realized that I also grew up in a construction family. Um, on the agency side, I wound up working with builders and real estate agents and mortgage brokers almost immediately every time. And it wasn't necessarily a choice, but I fell in love with the industry. Um, got to be a part of some really big national builders as they entered the Portland market and then spent about seven years working in-house for an on your land builder in the Pacific Northwest and had a short stint leading sales and marketing for a community builder most recently. Um, and I love working with builders and helping with their uh, just challenges and helping them grow. Uh, and I passionately believe uh, that marketing and kind of that brand, every aspect of what we do is part of our brand. So I like kind of helping in that area. So being a part of the conversation on trade agreements is something that I get really excited about. So thanks for having me. Great. No, thank you. And everybody, like I said, they're going to just love what they see from you. A lot of the graphics even to put together for this webinar, I put some out and then she nicely uh, suggested some much nicer looking graphics than what I had. So even on to keep me on brand here as well. So thank you for that. And I, I know you'll love it. Have a couple folks, Dave from Tennessee, just North of Memphis. Hello uh, to you and Robert, another fellow central Pennsylvanian. So coming in here. So that's why I'm at central PA. I know Melissa, you said out in 
uh, Washington area, right? Oregon, Washington, Washington, right? I'm right on the border, so I say yes to both. <laughs> Sounds good. That, that worked out too. So yeah, you're representing uh, uh, over on the, the West Coast as well. So thank you, thank you. Well, next I want to introduce Ken Pinto, a supply chain pro. I don't know if Ken, if that was the appropriate term to put, but that's how I look at you for kind of supply chain uh, pro. Um, founder owner of Kenzai USA, which I thought originally when I first met Ken, we've, we've known each other now for a couple years here, uh, that it was uh, some some fancy ninja term, but uh, he'll let you know a little bit about that. And I'm already going to promote this, Ken, because you know I'm going to do it too. How I first learned about Ken was his fantastic book. You can see I have it here. I get no royalties from this, <laughs> but um, I am a true raving fan here of the How Much is the Milk um, and Ken, I'll shut up and stop and let you do some promotion yourself and say who the heck you are, what you're up to. Thanks. I, I grew up as a tradesman. So I, I started uh, on construction sites when I was 12 years old. By the time I was in high school, I built, built five houses in my last two years of high school. I joined the Navy Seabees and did construction for the Navy in Spain, Cuba, Guam, Japan, several bases in Southern California. I am a carpenter, a mason, a plumber, electrician, a steel worker. My dad was a steel worker, uh, heavy equipment operator, pretty good surveyor. Uh, after after you know nearly 20 years in commercial construction, I went into the residential construction industry and spent 19 years working for the four of the top 10 home builders. I worked for Shea Homes, Pulte Homes, Standard Pacific Homes, and Toll Brothers. And I either ran the construction department or the supply chain department or both. I got into supply chain management, not because I wanted to, but because I had to. And I was in charge of construction with the responsibility of reducing cycle time and discovered very quickly that not having the right materials in the right place at the right time was a hindrance. And so I thought I'd get out of construction operations, go into supply chain management and fix that. And then I'd go back into construction operations. And here I am, you know, 20 years later, still working on it. So I had underestimated the size of the task. So to speed the process up, I wrote a book. So I wrote a book giving away all the secrets that I had discovered on supply chain management from, from a home builder. Uh, it's titled, How Much is the Milk? Because I compare buying building materials to buying groceries. And I know a lot of people think it's more difficult. It isn't. It is no more difficult than buying groceries. <clears throat> um, and I have been, so for the past 10 years now, or nine years now, I've been running a supply chain solutions company. I've been selling US made building materials overseas, uh, focusing on Japan. I speak Japanese, uh, also Korea, Guam, and Hawaii. And I, I have to go to Hawaii six or eight times a year, but you know, someone's got to do that. So it might as well be me. <laughs> and uh, since the book launched about uh, 14 months ago, I've been getting a lot of phone calls from home builders. Hey, hey, can you come take a look at what we're doing and see if there's any opportunity for improvement? So I do that. I'm teaching negotiation courses and um, just uh, my, my career is transforming. And so the last few years I have left my career, I'll do my best to improve the industry. Oh, that's wonderful too. So yeah, a lot of you can tell, like I said, I had a lot of, a lot of, well, just a full range of experience everywhere too. So I even see uh, Thunder Mounts Garage Systems join us. So thank you uh, for coming in here too. So Ken's going to, well, primarily I have Brian wanted to kind of represent the trade partners, those who are working with the builders, but he's already told me that I can't box him in, that he's going to be in there kind of talking about everything. And that's what I expect on that too. So, um, so yeah. So for your book, like you said, what, how much is the milk? It's how much is the milk.com. Is that correct? And you probably Indeed. said that in yes. there too. So again, go check it out. It'll, it'll blow your mind. It did on mine too. So thank you so much for being part of this too. And I know you're going to have lots of great uh, insight here as well. So. Great. Well, our third guest here uh, today, again, by alphabetical, not because he's uh, last in any way, is, is a really good friend of mine. I've known him forever, and we've talked about this before, is uh, attorney here. And we need to, you know, we need to make sure we keep the legal side of things, um, you know, good, I guess. I don't know. There's something about protection out there. Uh, and uh, Tony Potter here, or Anthony Potter here, uh, is going to uh, talk a little bit about that, keep us on point on that. But Tony, if you don't mind, thank you for being part of here. Say hi to everybody. Let everybody know that you know a thing or two about construction. Sure, too. absolutely. Brad, thank you so much. Tony Potter, and, and Brad knows me well enough, and for, for enough years, I, I go by Tony. So I am a practicing construction lawyer. I 
worked it off at Kerman. I, I started, I transitioned from the governor's office here in Pennsylvania. So I'm a, a central Pennsylvania guy as well. Um, transitioned in 2001 into a construction practice where I just sort of fell into it after uh, doing a little bit of work with DGS and the Department of Labor and Industry uh, in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. I focused my practice exclusively on uh, construction. So it's what I do 100% of my day. Uh, I'm the practice group leader here at Offit Kerman. And so we deal with these construction contracts on a regular basis and i'm used to seeing contracts or no contracts whatsoever because uh <laughs> i've had those cases so i i get involved in the front end in negotiating contracts i also get involved in the back end which is probably many of your least favorite thing to do which is why i should go last is is litigation because what we want to try to avoid is the time suck that it comes out of your business in litigation and one of the things i always tell my clients is contracts are really important fences right setting forth those roles and responsibilities are is the best way to manage risk um, whether you're dealing with trade partners or whether you're dealing with owners you manage expectations up front um, and you have a clear contract, you're less likely to be needing the litigator at the end of the, at the end of a project. Um, at the same time, you know, we live in a society now where it's very hard to avoid litigation. I love when clients come to me and they tell me they've never been in a lawsuit. Um, sometimes that's fabricated or made up <laughs> because I hear it a lot and then you'll find cases, but, um, uh, Try to avoid, and, and hopefully what we'll talk to you about a little bit in the drafting of, of the contract is how to avoid risks. And I think one of the things you'll note when you see Brad's agreement, and look, his his family was a very well-known builder in central PA, and, and they did a lot of things on a handshake. I knew Brad's father extremely well as, uh, and, and his two brothers. Uh, there were a lot of handshakes. Handshakes probably are not working as well in 2023 as they did in the 80s and the 90s. So I'll All leave right. you with that. Fair enough. Thank you. And I was supposed, I've, I've neglected my duties, everybody. I was supposed to make sure I put their email addresses up. I will do that as you guys are talking. So I neglected my duties as I went in there. But just so in case anybody wants to follow up with any of these folks afterwards, um, you know, certainly feel free to do so. I encourage you to reach out. Also ask the questions if you have some as we go along for any of us, because here, look at this, you're, you're getting uh, some good stuff. All right, so thank you, Tony. Thank you so much for being part of here. I know it's gonna do it. So what we're gonna do now, we're gonna actually jump over, gonna get away from a PowerPoint because you know not everybody loves PowerPoints. So let's see if I can figure out how to do this without too much of a problem. I'm gonna stop this screen and share another one. And we're gonna go over to the actual, I mean, this is truly the actual document we use with a handshake and a set of plans. So um, I kind of have an idea of how this is going to go from my panelists only because if any of you've seen my promotion coming up to this, I got like three separate emails from each one of our guests after I <laughs> shared this with them. <laughs> and it was a little bit from, I think Ken's was, wow, builders really use this. Um, you know, Tony, I think yours was, uh, where's the rest of it? <laughs> and that's exactly that. what it was. And, Melissa, uh, you were getting after me about just kind of the wording and like it's just not really. It, well, yeah, I think you're not. I just was, limited my response because that, that, of it yeah, the cringe. <laughs> the yes, politely you cringe. But so, so this was this was actually it. Now I want to bring folks up to speed on why this was it, and this is one page. It is that's all we used, right? So how this came about, and I, in my defense to everybody, as I sheepishly answered all the folks in here. Um, back in when this happened, I don't remember if it was the 90s or early 2000s, there was um, a some law that came out, and I'm certainly not a lawyer, don't play one on TV or anything, that basically said there was worry about any contractors or subcontractors or, or trade contractors that we use if they worked for us exclusively, because we had a lot of those that have worked with us for 20, 30 years, and again, on the handshake. But could all of a sudden the builder, we as the builder could be responsible for paying their workman's comp if they just worked for us. So every time, this was literally handed to me from uh, from our CFO at the time. So anytime you hire a new trade, you need to get them to sign this. And you can see it just kind of goes down through. 
most of the time we had to figure out what went in each of these little spots up here. It basically said, I'm a subcontractor. I'm not an employee. I have my own insurance. And that was pretty much it. So I'm going to, I'm going to start here. I see Ken already shaking his head. Ken, why don't uh, you gave me the nice email and I knew we heard from Melissa. I'll just, your initial thoughts from this whenever you saw that. <laughs> well, I think Tony called it out correctly. This document is a handshake. That's all it is. It's just a handshake because there's, there's, because if this document ever went to court, um, well, let's just call it a handshake because there's nothing else there. I mean, you know, the, the, a contract should do a few things. One is assign risk, right? It doesn't reduce risk. It doesn't minimize risk. It assigns risk. So, I, so if something's going to happen on a project that, that causes risk, the document should de, um, designate okay, you're going to be responsible for this, this, and this, and I'm going to be responsible for this, this, and this. And that assignment should be very clear. The more clear it is, um, the easier it is for each party uh, who signs that agreement to, to manage their end of that, that risk. Okay. Um, and, and then in, in a nutshell, you say, you know, that the contract should say what the contract, what the general contractor is going to do, what the subcontractor is going to do, and if we get a divorce, what's it look like? Right? So it should cover those things too. Um, uh, none of which so far does any of this cover. And then in addition to, you know, the, the contract documents, which in my case is a 16 page document, um, there are documents that aren't, uh, included, uh, uh, in the text, but are included by name. So here are some things that you should have no noted that are included in your, your, your document. And that's architectural plans, structural plans, post-tension plans precise grading plans, soils reports, interior noise, noise analysis, <clears throat> specifications, stormwater pollution protection plan, noise abatement requirements, applicable, bu applicable building codes, applicable energy codes, quantities of builder supplied materials, just a few things to, na to name it that should be included as, hey, just to let you know that in, a, in addition to what's in, written in this text, these documents are also included as part of this text. <clears throat> and so, so the, the clearer the documents are, the clearer, the easier it is for each party to understand what their responsibility is and, and understand their assignment of risk. All right. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I may have missed a little bit on that. So. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. All right. Mel Melissa, real quick, I'm going to, like I said, you reserved judgment there for a little bit, um, and reserved what you said. So. Bring it on. Come on. I'm not afraid. Go ahead and tell me what you think about our independent contractor statement. Well, on one hand, it's really nice because think of all the trees you're saving um, because <laughs> most of the uh, agreements I've seen are 20 plus pages. Um, we had about 20 pages the last builder I was at and we leveraged Mark system. So it was 20 pages plus we have these additional resources in Mark Systems. Go look here so you can see some of those other things that Ken was talking about and the more specific um, scope of work and details were um, in in our technology. So we have the, the tree that we gave each partner and um, the online resources. So congrats on the trees you saved. But um, the big thing that that I would say that is everything we do is part of our brand. I've said that before. And how does this make me feel if I'm your trade partner? And it doesn't make me feel good. And we know that we talk about the issue with the trades and we don't have them. And so you want something that's going to convey who you are um, as a brand, and this isn't there. And also um, it's a partnership. So what are you doing to help them? Um, and the more you can retain your partners, um, the better that is for you. So I would say that's what's missing um, is the personality of the brand um, amongst the many other things that Ken and Tony are probably more well qualified to talk about. But um, yeah, I would just say the brand having that present and we see time and time again that that helps save on how often you have to recruit is when you take care of those partners from day one. Yeah, no, and that, that's a really good point that you bring up too. I mean, especially mm -hmm. these days when we're finding uh, home builders all over are finding a little tougher to find the trades. 
I mean, kind of to bring your brand that you're talking about and what you believe in as a company, making sure they understand that too. I think that is an important way yeah. the builder of choice at this point too. And um, I'm sorry. Absolutely. And the one thing I would add to that is that your customer, the person that you're building for, cannot differentiate the plumber you hired from you. Right. If the plumber you hire does something that is against your core values, they're not mad at the plumber. They don't know who he is. They're mm -hmm. mad at you. So again, kind of like teaching them who you are and what your customers are expecting out of um, the partnership with you is really important. Very, very great. Very great point. I appreciate that too. Tony, I know you wanted to kind of come in on the end, but first Absolutely. of all, you, you looked at this too. How much protection was I? Well, I mean, let's let's I, and I don't want to be harsh, Brad. I mean, this is this Sorry, is a document that. that's not not tailored to what we're what we're all here to try to help the, the folks who are on yeah. the webinar plan for this document. When I, when I looked at it, it was like, where's the rest of the agreement? Mm -hmm. This was again, this was a, a handshake firm. Uh, you are dealing with a this is a clearly motivated document. This was driven by workers comp and unemployment comp. As soon as I saw it, I was like, why are you sending me the, you know, the independent contractor agreement that you're using to try to, you know, try to establish independent contractor status for UC or, or WC. And, and frankly, we could comment on that. You know, there's there are multiple different tests for that independent contractor status, whether you're dealing with it with the IRS or you're dealing with it on the unemployment compensation and workers' compensation. Uh, this document would need to be tightened up even for that. But okay. what it is missing, you know, anybody looks at this, we don't have scope, time, money. And I want to go back to what Ken was talking about, roles and responsibilities, right? Mm -hmm. Let's not, uh, an assigning risk. Yeah, I don't want to be just the person who's assigning risk, the negative Nelly lawyer. But look, roles and responsibilities should be assigned in the contract documents to the party that's best able to manage them. So if I'm dealing with a trade partner that's doing my mechanical systems, we should be really focusing that assignment of, hey, we want you to do all the mechanical work. We want you to do the the HVAC work and mm -hmm. you manage that risk. You're in the best place that you're in the best position to manage that risk. So we want to assign that risk to them. It, it's not atypical with, with how you deal want to deal with your owners. Who's in the best position to deal with the risk of loss of the property? Well, the owner is. And so we should be making that owner have property insurance in the contracts. We should have a requirement that imposes an insurance requirement on that owner. And then we should be passing down through as a risk management process to us as the home builder and then to our, our trade partners or subcontractors. I refer to them as subcontractors. Melissa's trying to, she's trying to shape my old brain, but I, I'm, I'm a little slow. So I may call them subcontractors. The subcontractors need to get that benefit as well, because it's a, a risk they can't manage from their business risk. So as a lawyer, as a business person, look for those business busters. Spot the things that will break your bank that are going to break that you can't manage. What happens if your plumber leaves a, a a heater on overnight and burns down a house? How are we going to manage that risk? That's risk that you don't have managed through your contract. We should be managing that through insurance provisions, right? Mm -hmm. And they should flow top to bottom and they should be consistent how we treat the owner's contract should be how we're treating are trade contractors. You don't want to sink your trade. You don't want to sink, but you also don't want to sink your plumber or HVAC mm -hmm. trade partner on that kind of risk. And it's not anything they can insure against. So we want to assign that role and responsibility to the owner because they can best manage it. They can buy property insurance mm -hmm. and insure against it. And then I'll tell you, hey, we ought to be waiving subrogation. So the insurance companies aren't chasing my builder or my subcontractor. So, I mean, Brad, this document is, you know, it is what it is. It, it clearly was motivated by some decision at some period of time, I think probably by unemployment comp, 
Mm. But there was an un unemployment or workers' compensation ruling maybe in the late 90s when workers' comp really was reformed here in Pennsylvania that your CFO got a hold of this. And I don't want to throw him under the bus, but you told me that's your draft. No names. No names. I'll roll that's him right. under the bus. Um, <laughs> And that's and he drafted this in response to probably the Home Builders Association sent out a, a legislative notification and everybody responded and now we have this agreement. Yeah. Okay. Well, good. And you made me think in the future I'll need to do one. We'll have to have a, a session like this with my actual agreement with my customers because I have that one too. We can look at. I'll share it too, and I know that's going to be specific. So we'll kind of kind of move this along, and I want to get back into that discussion in a little bit here in terms of the trade partner, trade contractor, subcontractor, because before we kind of started today, we were just talking amongst ourselves, and that just kind of came up in the last few seconds. So I want to I want to come back to that, but I want to kind of take uh, take everybody here that's attending kind of one step beyond what we did for this. So the very first thing Melissa did with what we have here which is obviously a little subpar for what uh, today's uh, needs are. And I'm going to try to share uh, this. Hopefully I get the right one too. I'm going to stop mm -hmm. this one. Present, uh, let's see. I think it's this one, I think. Let's see if this is the right one. Hey, all right. So she branded it up, made it look nice. Um, but it's exactly the same words that we had down here before. So we pretty much put lipstick on a pig. Is that what you're all telling me? Is that, we're not there yet. It looks nicer. It's a little bit of, um, any thoughts on that so far? We're, we're not there yet. And I know this is obviously not where we're going to end up at. Everybody it is won't. definitely prettier. All right. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. Let's just jump over to the, to uh, kind of our next working one. Cause what we thought we would do on this is really start talking about, let's take an agreement start looking at kind of the parts and pieces that are in here, discuss as a team what really should be. So I'm going to go over to kind of the next one because we're just going to skip away from this one <laughs> and uh, jump on over to, da, 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 I think it's, now i got to figure it out. Ah, yes, yeah, this one. Hopefully this is light right. So still looks much better. And you can, I don't know if you can see that. Melissa's in here too. This is a live Google Doc. So each of you, if you have the ability, can and can kind of go in and start doing it. So let's just talk about that independent trade partner agreement. I want to bring this up here now because, again, we've jumped into here. We thought, well, let's not call them subcontractors. Let's call them trade partner. And, Ken, you had some pretty strong thoughts on this. And I'm going to remember to put your email up this last time. I put Tony's up while he was talking. I think I covered over his picture. It felt bad. But uh, so here, Ken. So if anybody needs to talk to Ken, here's a great way to get in touch. As, as, a supply, as a supply chain manager, I, as a supply chain manager, I do have an opinion on the use of the term trade partner. Um, I was with the company that cre that invented that term, and uh, and actually trademarked it. It's, it's registered to Shea Homes. Hmm. Um, if you make it one word, a capital T, capital P, that's a that's a registered mark for for Shea Homes. Right. And so do we, I need uh, do I do we need a little copyright or trademark? If, if you used it that way, then you would, yeah. But right. there, but uh, but if you just use the words "trade partner," two separate words, you don't, don't worry okay. about it. I'd have to hire have to hire Tony to help me. <laughs> you have to help hire Tony. Yeah, you have okay, to. I'm sorry. You'd need an IP lawyer, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Go ahead. So, Ken, I'm sorry. Um, it, you know, when when we created that term, it was because we had such close relationships with a few of our, well, probably about eight or 10 of our subcontractors that was almost open book, both ways, open book yeah. on our side, open book on our, their side. We worked together to lower each other's costs because we knew what each other's costs were. We knew what was, you know, what was um, uh, hurting profit or helping profit for each of our companies. I mean, it was a really, really tight relationship. And, and that's when we said, hey, we can no longer call you subcontractor because nobody wants to be sub anything. Mm -hmm. And then we made trade partner, which was nothing more than marketing, right? It was pure marketing. Yeah. There was no, no nothing more to it than that. And so we did that. But you had to qualify for that. We didn't just give that name away to, to anybody. Oh. And so if they weren't trade partners, then we we did call them trade contractors, which is a little bit different than subcontractor in our in that company's language. And subcontractor could be uh, the entity that provides porta potties for your um, job sites or the entity that provides construction trailers for your job sites. We call those subcontractors. So it was a definition of terms that we use as policy in our company. 
And, and I've carried that through to say, you know, if you're, you know, there's risk in building houses. I mean, there's a bunch of risk. And depending on what state you're in, it's more risk than, than in, in other states. Hmm. And and if if you're a subcontractor and you're going to get paid, whether the home builder makes money or not, that's not really a partner, right? So a partner is someone where you have shared risk and shared reward. Hmm. And so that's why we created that, 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 that's, that, that term so many years ago. Um, because we did indeed have shared risk and shared reward. <clears throat> and so um, so I do that's why I'm passionate about uh, being careful of the word trade partner. And then in addition to that, the the term partner all by itself can mean a lot of things in the legal uh, industry. So a partnership where you're you're um, um, a partner in an s corporation or a uh, LLC LLC, or if you're doing a JV, I mean, those are partnerships, which you do not want to confuse when you're talking about subcontractors who are, you know, your plumber and your electrician and your carpenter. And so that's another reason why I like to veer away from it in, in contract documents from using the word trade partner. That was a lot of words to explain something yeah. that's probably trivial to most people, but that's uh, my reasoning behind it. Well, that's interesting. Melissa, I'm, I want to bring you in on this then too. Your, your thoughts since trade partner is marketing term if we can say that to or kind of a brand agree disagree what are your thoughts on that um get too much into it yeah no i mean i i think there probably are some legal um i i can see that being an issue but i i will say also um a joke i made with my ops people that i've worked with over the years is if we're not disagreeing then one or both of us probably isn't doing our job because mm -hmm. I'm going to be here to challenge you to um, progress the brand and you're going to be here to rein me in, keep us legal and keep us on budget. And so we have to work together and we have to challenge each other. And again, what I would say, like cause some of my comments have been about how do we keep this a long term relationship? And for me, that is investing in treating our trade partners like partners and that can be by offering them education um, there's a lot of trade partners who like maybe we were able to help some of our trade partners for example um, figure out how to file for ppp because we were a bigger builder we knew how to do that and we're going to share our resources out of our sense of partnership with them and we're partnered if we treat them like partners and talk to them like partners are we setting them up for success that's going to be a little bit longer running and then are they therefore going to be that partner to us for a longer term sure. so i would debate it but at the end of the day i want to do what's legal and right for for the organization because um i don't think i've ever worked for a builder to tony's point um that hasn't been sued <laughs> so um i know that's a thing i know people enjoy that i mean they sue mcdonald's for hot coffee why not a home builder right so mm. um I want to do what's legal and right, but what I would still fight for, even if we didn't use that term, is how do we still spread that feeling of partnership and growth together so that they're living out our values and treating our customers right and building the homes how we want and becoming those long-term mm -hmm. partners um, while protecting you know, our heinies, which is like the point of your yeah. first one, right? It's the heine protection. Yep, the old CYA, as we call it. Yes, CYH as well. Uh, no, it's it's a great point, and and kind of for the builder side of things, I like the sound of the trade partner agreement. Not, again, not thinking from the legal point of view as well, but it's like, you know, how do we bring them in? Looking at this now, I mean, I, I like it. Never even dawned on me to think about that from a, a legal side. So, um, Tony, let me bring you in on this real quick too. Are we again thinking too hard into this, or a trade partner hearing kind of both sides here? Your thoughts on that? No, I, I think our discussion in, in the very beginning, as we started up uh, in the backstage, fancy word, right? We're backstage. Our discussion focused on, you know, can you create that feeling in the document, and and then ultimately just define it and. and treat it as a subcon, you know, define it and, and call it subcontractor throughout, because I don't think you are creating a partnership agreement. And I don't think you want to create a partnership agreement here. You don't want a joint venture uh, type of liability or responsibility to the entity. Mm -hmm. 
that's enough of the law though, because one of the things that Ken raised, and I think one of the things that I find most interesting about this is that I'm more interested to hear the comments on open book and spot the issue on open book and shared risk and shared rewards. Mm -hmm. And that concept of tiering your subcontractors, trade partners, whatever you're classifying them at from a, from a business perspective. And I, I often take off my, my lawyer hat and, and put on my business hat. I don't like to always live in the law. So I'm, I'm, diverting from the legal question and going down <laughs> into what I found more interesting, the business question, that concept right. of open book and have, have the others on this line contemplated having that structure, uh, that free flow of information between you and your other subs or trade partners. And ultimately that to me leads to a much more collaborative environment and mm -hmm. leads to a much more successful project if you have good partners. And so from my perspective, I don't want to get caught up in the words and how we define it. We can manage that on the back end of the agreement. Mm -hmm. But for, for a one hour session, what I hope people hear is Ken's comment about, hey, is there a different way to do this? Can we create an open book where we actually are sharing information and we can increase each other's profit? And we have this dynamic collaborative business arrangement in the contract. Hmm. And that's got to okay. be in the contract. It's not just words. You can pretty it up and put a lot of lipstick on the pig and call them trade partners. You can call them widgets. I don't care what you call them. But if if you make the economics matter, match what Ken is discussing, there's a okay. great opportunity for success, mutual uh, success. Good to hear. Well, let's let's think of a, a name to hear us. Now we have someone out on Facebook did this. And unfortunately, on Facebook. You, you, uh, we only get Facebook users, so I don't get your name. So I apologize for that. I think on on this, you have to give a permission to share your name, and it's not that big of a deal. But you're using trade contractor agreements, and I think we talked a little bit of before going on panel here. Are you pretty comfortable with that too? Um, name at least again, like Tony said, for an hour long or something else. I'm comfortable with that. I mean, I, I can I can get comfortable with the terminology as long as you define the terminology in the agreement. Yeah. I mean, I feel comfortable that if, and look, you can do a lot of that work in the boring general terms and conditions in the definitional section. And you can utilize this scope, sort of this memo scope, uh, first seven pages of the agreement to be a little more colorful and a little more friendly, a little more okay. business organizational, right? And then like my my general strategy is to put a lot of the terms and conditions in a, an mm -hmm. attachment that's in exhibit A where a lot of the boring terms and conditions, you know, insurance, indemnity, waiver of subrogation, limitations of liability, the stuff that nobody wants to hear about is in the general terms and conditions. You need to pay attention to that with your trade partners or your trade contractors or your subcontractors. I don't care whatever you're calling them, but I'd rather put that into the back of the business relationship. Everybody should be focused on it. But I think Melissa's really needs to lead, right? If you want to develop a relationship and, and maybe you're not going to share as much information as Ken suggested with open book because you don't have, you're not there yet. You haven't worked together like Shea Holmes did with six or seven of them. You may only have second tiers that you're not comfortable sharing your books with and how much money you're making and then sharing profit at the end of the day. Okay. You know, it's, it's just something you, you it's a strategy. It's a business strategy. All right. Ken, you can look like you have something to add in here. I was hoping Ken was going to jump in here. <laughs> yeah. It, well, first of all, I have to say, you know, and this is the unspoken part of the messages we've been putting out there so far is that I'm just delighted. I am just delighted that we think that people read these darn contracts. I mean, I, <laughs> Come on. throughout my career, I can tell you it is so difficult to get people to read the darn contracts. So, One page. Uh, you know, the fact that we they have read it when they want to sue you, for sure. <laughs> when they want to sue <laughs> you, they read every word. 
<laughs> so that's so true. that's exactly right. You know, I, mm -hmm. I lived I lived very close to a free freeway entrance, and you know, we talked to the city for a long time about the guardrail needed to go up there because it was pretty dangerous. And there were a couple of crashes, and we and for years and years and years, nothing got done. Someone crashed and died. That car, a guardrail went right up. And so sometimes we wait until a tragedy happens before we, we, we put something in place. And I think, you know, if I look at all the, the subcontract agreements that I've put in place at the different builders I've worked for, most of the, the paragraphs we put in there are a result of an issue we've had with, uh, with uh -huh. litigation. Yeah. So, you know, that's what changes us, you know, and so, uh, Brad, you're very fortunate to, to not have a 16 page uh, terms and conditions document because you didn't get sued, you know, eight times uh, a year, you know, or on every project you built or, right. uh, you know, so I think that's part of the, the advantageous part there that, and, and, you know, we, we do things out of necessity when, and, that, and we learn hard lessons and then that's why our contracts look the way they do. Right. I can tell you that with that, uh, there was a period of time when there was a lot of disagreement in our company, and we did a survey uh, with our subcontractors and tried to find a subcontractor who was offended by the term subcontractor, and we couldn't find one. But, but, but within our company, within our home building company, we were split 50-50. Oh, no, they hate that term. Oh, no, they don't care. Oh, no, they hate that term. Oh, no. And we fought internally about whether our subcontractors uh, uh, and then at the survey, you know, we discovered that they really didn't care one way or the other. So gotcha. I, if if you can market it and get something out of it, then then go for it. All right. Are we okay with trade contract agreement? Because I know we, uh, at least for now. We can yep. all agree on that. I, I think we can good. Go. All, right, cool. <laughs> all right. Woo. All right. So, uh, Melissa, I'm going to have you kind of just talk a little bit about, you know, and again, I'll, I'll change this while you're talking about kind of what you're talking about in here, I mean, it looks like on this first page here again, let's just call it what, what, whatever we're going to call it, the touchy-feely, the good stuff, the brand stuff, you know, you, but you're still getting some of the things we're going to need. And then we're going to jump down to page two and talk about some of the different sections and get to there. But if you want to kind of talk a little bit about this, I'll change this up here right now to contractor at this point. Sure. And, <laughs> and what I'll it. say too is I think this conversation is fantastic and I'm loving the comments on the side that you guys are making. I think... I think after this mm -hmm. webinar, we'll take some of your content comments and some of the things that we've talked about here, and we can share this like little mocked up version with you. So it's so you guys can all kind of gain from not just what we're saying, but the individual comments. Mm -hmm. um, but so what I have here is the introduction, right? And it's it starts out with in bold. Well, first it's the gratitude because I lead everything. <laughs> I try to lead with love and gratitude in all that I do. Um, and yes, it's okay to lead with love in home building. Um, but the mission statement is the very second line in bold and just saying, this is what we're devoted to do. And this is what we need you as, as our partner in home building or contractor or someone who's worked on this project with us, however we want to say it. This is what we need you to help us live up to. And then again, out of that like token of partnership, like here's what we need um, for success from you. Um, and it's just the basics. Like this is this is just saying, hey, say you got this. And these are the things we have to get to pay you because at the end of the day, no matter how much we love what we do, um, we do it for the money. <laughs> so so we know that that is as as our partner, as our contractor, as someone working with us, that is your number one concern. So we want to make that really clear. These are the things legally that we need from you to pay you. So let's get that taken care of. And can you sign and make sure you understand? So that's page one. All right. Nice. Now, do you uh, think we ought to have any reference? Oops, that was a cap on there. This is why I think it was or incomplete. Um, on here to say, see this, or do we not need to? Because it's just kind of a table of contents. Do we need it as a table of contents? Do we go back in and I'm asking any of you, just do we say, or see addendums or are the table of contents? Do we just rename that addendums? And do that? Well, what we have here is with this signature, I understand my responsibility to read, understand and uphold the policies and best, best practices outlined in the seven sections of the partner agreement and scope of work. So what we're saying is 
they want you to sign this first thing, but that is just basically saying you're going to read all these other things that we gave you and you're going to make sure you, you know, it's your job to understand it. And if you have questions, um, here's okay. who we are. And like Ken said, they'll all read it. I'm sure of that and they'll be like, just give me the work. Yeah. yeah kind of, yeah. Okay. I am curious cool. in this group, like how many sections, how many sections do your current trade partner agreements have? Is, you're talking about um, actually, attendees? This one has okay. eight. Yeah, this one has eight now. Okay. Um, is eight a lot? Is eight not that many? Yeah, let us know out there how many you may have in yours, if you have one. And if you don't, you don't feel bad because you saw my, I, I only had one section in mind. In case you didn't yeah. know. You could read mine, okay, Ken? You could read mine, okay. Um, so cool, <laughs> let's talk about then uh, section one, then you have partner information. So what do you typically see in this? Is that different than what's up here or was that section one or is this Yeah, now that's gonna be right? all of their contact information, their address, it's gonna be where to send the check, um, any, any relative information that you need from a sub or a partner um, is okay. gonna live in there and you wanna make it, um, so obviously, Brad, your version was intended to be printed and filled out with a pen mm -hmm. on the job site. Um, but now you need to make it mobile friendly and fillable. And okay. um, that's something you can do, everyone, really easily in Google Docs um, with tables. So make it really easy for people to fill out from their phone. Um, like the fillable part is important. Nice. Let's see. All right. Oh, Tony has. There. Sections and Gustavo has a question. Gustavo has a question. It says, um, Oh, I see that. We have yeah. both. Do we want to look at that? It. No, go for it. Yeah, go for it. Uh, we have all uh, seen overhead garage door industry standard installation. I'm trying to improve standard with my projects. Any thoughts on hmm. that? We might need to, yeah, follow up on that one there too. Yeah. Tony, yo. Okay, here, Tony, I'm just going to show it. So thank you, Gustavo. I am we'll try to get to that here, too. Tony, you're saying you have six sections, four exhibits. Very nice. Okay. Yeah. That's hey, just to be the lawyer in the house, so one of All the right. things I think you want to do is that you want to make sure what your actual lead contract, big C, big D documents are. Um, to me, some of these exhibits, my first reaction is they don't have to be big C, big D documents, but like Ken talked about, you need, you're almost certainly going to have some drawing uh, for each of these trades, whether, you know, for the mechanical, you're probably not going to incorporate the civil plans, right? Mm -hmm. For the mechanical, you're probably not going to incorporate the structural plans, but you you very likely are going to incorporate mechanical and electrical plans. And that, in my experience, should be a big C construction document. Big C, now, when big D, incorporated by reference. So now, when, it, when we go up, go up, Brad. So I okay. mean, it, as a defined term. So one of my, like, if I were, if I were writing this, this, section before the signatures, I would be incorporating by reference those exhibits that I want to pull into the actual contract and making clear what the contract is. So um, just as, an, as a matter of art, so it's not just you're knowledgeable about these, but I want to tell them these are actual contract documents. So we don't get into a circumstance where your sole and exclusive contract is this first pretty sheet, right? The, the, the more marketing, I want to actually incorporate by reference the general conditions. I want to have drawings incorporated. If we have specs, which in home building, usually you don't have a 13 volume specification section. But if you look over on my drawing table, I have a 13 volume specification section for a really large uh, multifamily house, right, in, in DC. But that doesn't usually exist with most home building. Maybe there's some specs that will be incorporated and maybe you have specifications that you use. Those should be a contract document that's incorporated into whatever they're signing by reference. And okay. Ken mentioned that. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, Ken talked about getting those documents incorporated. It's really just getting them incorporated by reference as an exhibit. All right, and do you mind me asking just, and again, you have to dumb some things down for me at times too. When you say the big C and the big D, 
For those who and might not know what that, what the heck do you mean by that? You capitalized. Mind. So I'm, I'm, I am dumbing it down. That was not, I was not, that All was right, Perry County. You have to County really dumb it down. We, that was we're Perry County guys. speak, yeah. I'm, I'm used to one page now, so yeah. So <laughs> I was saying capital C and capital D, meaning that it would be a defined term in your uh, contract. So you would okay. say contract, big C, capital C, capital D, contract document or contract. I don't care which okay. term you define, just right, define it and tell me what's in and what's out. I was like thinking a non-disclosure agreement, which is down in this section, a non-disclosure confidentiality agreement, I would ordinarily expect that, that to be a standalone. Okay. You know, you could have it incorporated in, but I don't feel really strongly that that non-disclosure confidentiality agreement has to be in. Okay. It could be a separate standalone. You could make it incorporated by reference. Or separate. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. if you're if you're getting and look, I have a lot of clients come to me and say, Look, I don't want the eight hundred page book. I don't <laughs> want the standard consensus document. I don't want the standard AIA document. I'm doing a relatively small two, three million dollar project. I need something that's a little more manageable for my client. Hmm. And they don't gotcha. want the tomb. And even though you so, didn't have a non-disclosure agreement, most so, uh, standard agreements have a confidentiality um, clause in there that will, will, I think, satisfy most of the desires of those who are looking for an NDA. Yeah, right. I, I agree with that, Ken. And that was, I think that's I, that was going to be one of my other points, but I talked too much. So you, I'm going to let you talk <laughs> about that. You're right. That, right. that there's usually a confidentiality provision in most general terms and conditions. So you can put it in okay. as one paragraph. So it may just have a, yeah. And, and I'm just calling these sections right now. And like I said, as Melissa said, we can clean this up a little bit here too, um, as we kind of come through in you know, general terms and conditions. Yeah. All right. Um, partnership agreement. Is that kind of what this is or any thoughts on that, on how that could be used or is that kind of redundant? Is that what this whole thing is? No, I, I would stay away from, from that um, because you're not entering into a partnership. Second. All right. I would second that. Stay away from it. We're going to just do this here. Can I change? Is there a strike through up here? Melissa, any thoughts on that? Or are you just going to, you okay with it as <laughs> they're saying? She's, she's good. Okay, good. All right. I'm not sure how to strike through on this thing, too. I'm sure there's a way to do it, but I'm not going to take everybody's time while I do that. I'm just going to say, Move to strike. Then I sound like a. I sound like yep. I'm a, oh, Robert's there rules. Go. There we go. All right. Hazardous materials me memorandum. Is that again a standalone optional type of deal or? Yeah, I think that, that you know hazardous materials is a portion of a whole section on environmental compliance, which includes stormwater pollution protection plans. Um, uh, radon abatement. Um, I mean, there's a bunch of things that can fall under that category of which I think a hazardous material memorandum would be a portion of. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, state required documents would be anything that's specific to, I mean, we have folks here from Tennessee and Texas yeah. and a couple of places. So local jurisdiction Absolutely, and especially in the home building industry, right? Because so often, so much of this is regulated in the 50 states because of the consumer level, mm -hmm. right, that you're dealing with. So there are oftentimes mandatory phraseology, mandatory license numbers, you know, lots of different things that, that, that fit in that section. I think it is a necessary part for a home builder. Cool, great. Now, the job site agreement general statement of work, and I know we're coming up close here to the hour already, folks, so we're coming up onto the end. Ken, I know when you said, and I know, uh, Tony, you said, too, yours are 18 pages long. We're only on page two at this point, too. Do you want to name a couple things in here that, you know, we want to be thinking about in terms of general statement of work? Ken, I'll let you go ahead and anything that, you know, I'll try to type as you're talking. Uh, <clears throat> safety. So there should be an That's agreement as to what what we're uh, was required on the say on your safety program okay. clean job site so if you have expectation so the biggest the, the most damaging things to a relationship are unspoken expectations right that's true in your marriage it's also true on your job site 
So um, if you have an expectation of a clean job site, it should be it should be labeled out here. Working okay. hours, weekend work, et cetera, that should be that should be um, detailed out. Mm -hmm. Quality of workmanship. I mean, that's we want some kind of details in there to say, hey, we have an expectation of quality, whether it meets uh, ANSI or ASTM standards or or another standard of workmanship that should be detailed out. Remedies. What? We, what do we do when something goes wrong? So we need to have we need to talk about remedies, whether it's a small thing on a uh, just you know the plumber made a mistake, you know, we had a leak over the night, it's you know it's done some damage, uh, or if we have something more severe, we, we need to understand what what we need to have an agreement on or clear expectation of what remedies are. Okay. Uh, liens and waivers of liens, um, bonds if required not common in our industry but in some places uh, i know builders who require bonds mm -hmm. um warranties work which is a work performance standard um right to repair uh, is is a, a law now in i'm not sure how many states but a lot of them now and so there needs to be a clear ex understanding clear expectations of what the right to repair expectations are from your subcontractor payment terms let's Detail out those payment terms. Indemnification. Tony talked about indemnification. Boy, we could spend a lot more than an hour just on indemnification. Um, I'm not, I, you know, I'm just going to actually leave it right there just like that. Um, <laughs> Very good. Let, man, oh man, I yeah, I'm, I fit a lot into this hour, don't I? And let me Dude, let me like encourage it. you as Ken goes through two of the more important items that you're going to negotiate on the payment terms. Look, there are you know differences when you're dealing with I don't know how many of you use paid when paid clauses, but there's a difference and a distinction in almost uh, in a lot of jurisdictions. I'm not going to say almost all, but most jurisdictions, unless it is a you know express condition precedent, you've got to make it very very clear that it's going to be interpreted by a court as a timing mechanism. So if it is a we pay you when we get paid paid when paid, most courts will interpret that as being not a condition precedent. So if you don't get paid at all because the owner, the, the homeowner, you know, goes bankrupt, you're still going to have to pay your sub, right? There are very clear and, and there are multiple jurisdictions where you have to lay out this condition precedent uh, concept. I would encourage you as you're drafting these payment terms to be fair. Right, fair uh -huh. is always good. Mm -hmm. So on the indemnification, what I tell people, indemnification is a, we could spend an hour on that, right, Ken? Um, Easy. Yeah. We can't and make we're people not spend another it. hour. No. So the easiest way to balance an indemnification clause is make it mutual. Make the make your trade contractor indemnify you for their negligence, and you agree to indemnify them for your negligence. It's Agreed. the easiest way to get to a, a, a strike, a neutral balance, and do the same thing for the owner. That's my <laughs> suggestion. Better business terms. I can draft the nastiest. I'll you're gonna require you're gonna be able you're gonna be required to defend, indemnify me, and pay my attorney's fees and my firstborn for your trade contractor and make that clause read that they have to pay for my own negligence. It's not a good business relationship. It's not going to be a good long-term business relationship. My suggestion is that you try to draft the indemnification complicated subject. If your only one takeaway from this is draft it mutual, you'll get to a, a better place with your trade contractors. Okay. Which is, a, which is a great segue into my next uh, bullet point, which is insurance requirements. And some subcontractors can't get insurance if you have a type one indemnity. So uh, yep. it's a good discussion to have with your subcontractors about uh, your indemnity clause about, you know, because it may affect the price of their insurance or whether they can even get insurance. And so uh, you may uh, decide as a builder to make adjustments to your indemnity clause based on what you know, the price that you're going to end up paying through your subcontractor's additional insurance, which becomes their overhead, which is added to the price of your products. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and last one on my uh, list was term and termination. So 
uh, if something happens and we're going to get a divorce, we need to clearly understand what's going to happen and how, how that, how that gets done. Cool. No, real good. I, I think these are great things too. And I know we're, we've come up to the top of the hour here and I don't mean to rush folks there. It's, can I have happens. one, can I have one bread I after suppose. the termination? Yeah, go for add, it. Add a dispute resolution. So pick how you're going to resolve the dispute. All right. So, you know, mediation followed by litigation, mediation followed by arbitration, no mediation, we just beat the shit out of each other, excuse my French, um, <laughs> in court or in arbitration. All right. Okay. Fair enough. And yeah, so folks, what we want to do is we want to get this obviously cleaned up because like I said, I had no idea it's live TV, what's going to happen here <laughs> as we kind of put some stuff together, see how far we get. But it's okay with everybody. I, you know, I can try to get uh, this out. Evan, thank you for saying this is educational on that too. Uh, Daniel, you had a question there. And again, I want to make sure if I can get this too. And, and Melissa, you can help me if, if I'm reading this right. It said, could the NDA be spider web connected? to the CD, like if not the first item is ABC, then you don't get to C&D. Um, would that be a kind of like a, are you talking Daniel on that is like, you're not gonna see stuff if it's not an actual paper document or am I misunderstanding? Maybe Melissa, maybe you can chime in for your thoughts on that. Or am I misunderstanding? I, I did think that was a question for Tony, um, okay. but it, cause it was very specific on the NDA. Um, so I asked the question again. It says here, uh, Daniel says, can the ed could the NDA be spider web connected? And that's in parentheses to like, the, to the capital C and D. If it's not if okay. not the first items A B C, you don't get to the C and D. Does that make sense? Yeah, it could sure be. It can be. And and that, well, that's uh, are we saying that can talk correctly, about. Daniel? I mean, NDA okay. insurance for the C and D. Okay. Yeah, I I just caution right. you on. No, we must have lost Ken. That's okay. I, okay. I would caution everybody on the non-disclosure and confidentiality provisions because a lot of the – when you try to define, and every time I, I get one of these confidentiality statements from a, a lawyer, my first question is, okay, you need to define for my client what is confidential. And you need to flag it and you need to identify it when it's sent. And ordinarily in most of these types of commercial home building relationships, there's not a lot of trade secrets, confidential information, government. You know, the white balloons are generally not flying over to get the pictures of uh, the home builders uh, site if you get okay. what I mean. And so you yeah. need to have legitimately confidential information that you're trying to protect. That's true with your employment agreements as well. Right. Saying something is confidential and then not having mechanisms inside your firm to protect what is truly confidential for an employee is the easiest way to get a court to say, get out of my jurisdiction, get out of in front of my bench because what you're trying to enforce is not truly a confidential and it's not protected and it cannot be protected because you haven't done the things to protect that information. My strong suspicion is most of the information you're sharing with your trade contractors or your subcontractors is probably not legit confidential information. Sure. Thank you for that. Hope, hopefully, Daniel, that helped too. I, I'm just going to uh, finish up here real quick because we're out there. Again, we'll try to get some final things out here and out to you. I'll email out since I couldn't figure out the way to do this one here. Key takeaways here. I don't know that's completely. This is what I guessed before we had everybody on. Agreements have evolved. It is the 21st century. It's not the 1990s anymore. Again, infuse your brand into your agreements. I was hoping we'd have a chance. But again, I don't want to keep folks, especially those of us on the East Shore who are, you know, are ready to turn into pumpkins or anything. Um, you know, meet trades and suppliers in advance. They are your partners, whether we're talking, we've learned today, it's not legally partners. So if you want to call them trade contractors or whatever, it's not a legal partnership on that end. But obviously I think what Ken was talking about too. And I think what a lot of us were saying is meet with your trades, talk to them. Don't, it's not all one-sided anymore. So what, you know, it's not a legal partnership you're getting into, but obviously I, I would have to agree on, on, uh, the, uh, the side of, yeah, they are your partners in the sense, in the whole building type of deal. And then protect your company's 
and your partners. We're talking a little bit about, tech, you know, it's more than just the CYA document that I have on that one too. And, uh, you know, obviously for legal purposes, review with your own legal counsel, those kinds of things too. Last, just a real quick ad for me. I am coming out with a blueprint reading class for beginners. So if you are interested, you can drop me a line at my email if you want at brad at bradhubbard.com. I'm happy to share that with you. There it is on that. I guess I can put mine out there too. But I want to thank you guys. I knew Ken must have had to jump off because we went over the hours on that too. Uh, I can take any last minute questions, but I don't want to keep anybody any longer. Uh, Melissa, Tony, anything you want to add here is I kind of brought this to a quick end. I apologize. Um, I guess I would say I love, I appreciate being part of this conversation. Um, super responsive on LinkedIn. If anyone wanted to just um, chit chat more about my thoughts on the brand experience, even um, in the operation side, um, anytime, uh, or you can email me, but uh, yeah, I'm available to talk about this anytime. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Tony as well. There's your email up there in you. case anybody has more legal questions. You're out of PA. Do you go beyond PA or do you pretty much? We have you? offices in LA. We have offices in North Carolina and uh, okay. generally from New York down to North Carolina on the East Coast uh, right. and in Los Angeles on the West Coast. Very good. So. All right, folks. Well, thank you so much. Uh, we'll, hopefully, we'll be able to do something in the future again together and we'll see where things go. And I don't know if we'll do the the live thing uh on on site but we'll definitely have some really good things too you guys like i said you're my favorite people uh thanks to <laughs> ken pinto like i said who had to go that's ken's information if you want to get in touch with ken i want to make sure you have that too thank you everybody have yourself a great great week and i truly truly appreciate your time see everybody thank you all bye